Now, they are some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in the world. Jeff Bezos, Michael Bloomberg, Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, just to name a few. Well, Pulitzer Prize winning ProPublica reporter Jesse Isinger has delved into their never before seen tax returns. They reveal that when it comes to income tax, these business moguls only pay a tiny fraction of the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, their fortunes grow every year. Here's our Hari Srinivasan speaking to him about how they manage to legally work the system. Bianca, thanks. Jesse Isinger from ProPublica, thanks for joining us. You know, there's that old cliche, there's only two things certain in life, death and taxes. But your report, what it finds is if you're really, really wealthy, taxes, not so much. How did, how did you find this information? We have obtained, ProPublica has obtained uh, over 15 years of information, tax information, tax returns, and information from the schedules that go into the returns about things like stock trading and gambling winnings and partnerships uh, for thousands of the wealthiest individuals. This is really just the 1% of the 1%. We're not commenting on how we obtain the material. We're uh, trying to protect the source or sources, um, but uh, we are explaining that we verified it extensively and are being very careful stewards of the information. So when you look at this, you, this is the first of your series of reports, but you see a glaring pattern here. Most of us anecdotally think, well, the rich probably have better accountants, etc. But what you're showing is a structural flaw in the system. Yeah, exactly. This isn't about uh, evading taxes exotically and illicitly. This is about routine and perfectly legal tax avoidance strategies. And you don't need a fancy accountant for this. Um, what we show is the system and the system's essential unfairness, which is that average Americans are stuck in the tax system. We have no choice in the matter. We work to live, uh, we have to work. Um, we get salaries and taxes get extracted from our paychecks. Um, the wealthy, the ultra wealthy especially, are completely outside of this system entirely. They don't have to take income. When they do take income, it's in the time of the place of their choosing. And therefore, they can really lower their tax burden or not have a tax burden. Um, and what we show is that some of these guys, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Michael Bloomberg, Carl Icahn, they actually paid zero in federal taxes in recent years. So Jeff Bezos, let's take a look at him for a second. You've got a little card on your website. It says between 2014 and 2018, his wealth grew $99 billion, but his total reported income, which is different than your wealth growing, is $4.22 billion. That's about 4% of his wealth. And on that, he paid $973 million in taxes. Now, people are going to look at that number and say $973 million, in that's a lot of tax. Right. What's the point that you're making? Right. So, uh, it does. It's a. It's an enormous number. Um, we can't even contemplate that number, much less the hundred billion dollars that his wealth grew. But the essential number here is that it is a fraction, a tiny fraction of his wealth growth. And what we're arguing in the piece essentially is that wealth growth is the true measure of his income, the equivalent of average people's income. And so when you compare that figure, that figure of almost a billion dollars to a hundred billion dollars, it's about 1%. It's slightly less than 1%. Um, the average person's income, when that's taken out for taxes, it's about 14%. So the average person making 60 or $70,000 a year is paying $14 in taxes each year. And Jeff Bezos on the relevant figure is paying less than $1. And why do we think this is the relevant figure? Well, everything emanates from wealth growth for the ultra wealthy. They, uh, all of their power, all of their influence, uh, all of the way that they can purchase lavish lifestyles. Jeff Bezos is building a 
yacht for his yacht, um, a yacht that uh, will take the helicopters for his yacht that is worth uh, or costing about half a billion dollars. Um, he bought, of course, the Washington Post for half that, $200 million. Um, it affords him political influence. All of that comes from his wealth. What's incredible to us, what was astounding to us, is that all of this wealth growth is really outside of the tax system almost entirely. And just not tax because of what we choose to tax in this country and what we choose not to tax. In those years that you had Jeff Bezos' filings, he, he took a child tax credit? Yes, in uh, 2011, he uh, reported a very modest amount of income and then was able to wipe that out with deductions. Um, and because of that, he had so little income that he was able to claim the child tax credit for then two children, $4,000. So he actually had negative income. He had a credit um, from the U.S. government. The, uh, he was then in 2011, uh, clearly one of the richest people in the world. Um, but you know, every dollar counts. So where do the ultra wealthy get their money to spend, right? I mean, you and I have checking accounts and saving accounts and maybe a retirement account if we're lucky, right? But we also have an income that comes in every couple of weeks and we say, okay, well, this is my budget. Well, if you're super wealthy and you aren't getting an income, because a lot of tech billionaires will actually just work for a dollar a year. So where are they getting that money? Yeah, that's a very good point. They don't take salaries often. Jeff Bezos has a middle-class salary of about $80,000. And then we've seen kind of ostentatious displays of $1 salaries from the likes of Mark Zuckerberg or uh, the Google boys, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. So your question is, where do they get the money? And the answer is not for everybody, but often they're borrowing. They're borrowing against their stock. They put up their stock as collateral and they're borrowing. So somebody like Elon Musk discloses in his security filings that he's pledged tens of millions of dollars of stock and borrowed against it again for tens of billions of dollars. Um, and this is how they fund their lifestyles often. Um, there's no, we don't have any evidence that Bezos is borrowing. Uh, he may be, he may not be. Not everybody has the same hymn book here. But uh, what's happening is they borrow. And when they borrow, of course, they're not taking income. They're not selling their stocks. They're not paying capital gains uh, on that stock that they're not selling. They're keeping control of their companies. And when you borrow, you don't pay any income tax on the borrowing. So it's a win, win, win uh, in all of the ways that you can imagine. So if I'm a billionaire, I just decide to go to a bank and say, you know, I'm good for it. I got multiple billions of dollars in stock. Why don't you just what loan me a couple of hundred million at two or three percent? Because that's cheaper for me to pay you back than it is to pay Uncle Sam if I actually cash that out and look like I made 200 million? Are you are thinking small, couple hundred million? Um, uh, Carl Icahn has essentially something like a mortgage for a billion two that uh, was in his tax filings. Um, and as I say, uh, Elon Musk has tens of billions and Larry Ellison of Oracle disclosed in securities filings a few years ago that he had a $10 billion credit line. So start thinking a little bigger. Um, but yes, banks are happy to offer these guys. They are good for it. And they um, charge relatively low interest rates. And you just roll over that debt all the way, sometimes all the way until you die. And we'll get to that in a second. But the whole strategy is encapsulated by the phrase, buy borrow, die. That's an Ed McCaffrey phrase. He's a tax professor from USC. And what it is, is you buy your asset or you build your asset. Obviously, Bezos and Musk built their companies. You inherit uh, the Waltons and the Mars family have inherited great fortunes. Then you borrow against it. And then you can evade or escape or avoid, not really evade because it's all legal. Um, you can avoid taxation at death. Um, you can avoid the estate tax through different kinds of maneuvers. And then essentially, your great fortune has been almost untaxed throughout your life and into debt. 
So here's the thing. Some of the people that you profiled, you took uh, you kind of made baseball cards out of uh, Warren Buffett and Michael Bloomberg. These are people who Michael Bloomberg on the campaign trail campaigned for changes in taxes. Warren Buffett famously has come out and said, this doesn't make any sense that I pay less tax as a percent than my secretary does, right? So uh, what did you find about what they're doing legally? Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question, uh, Buffett, because what we found is that no one has avoided more tax for as long as Warren Buffett. Um, and he's regarded as a kind of grandfatherly figure. Um, he's beloved. And of course, he has come out to his credit and said that the wealthy don't pay enough in taxes. But when he's talking about that, he's talking about it in this extraordinarily narrow way, where he says taxes on income are too low uh, for the wealthy. And capital gains taxes are too low. And he says, I have capital gains um, sometimes, and uh, I pay a very low rate compared to my secretary. Um, and he's right. He pays a relatively low rate. But what's really extraordinary about Warren Buffett is he takes so little income. He takes tiny fractions of his enormous wealth. Now he's worth over $100 billion. Um, and he takes tiny, tiny fractions of that in income and then pays a very small percentage of that. So when we measured how much he paid in taxes compared to his wealth growth, he actually pays 10 cents uh, for every $100 that his wealth grows. 10 cents for every $100 his wealth grows. The wealthy, the top 25, pay $3.40 for every $100 their wealth grew, the richest 25 people in America. Meanwhile, as I say, the average American, when you talk about income tax, which is really the, the, the way they are taxed, it's $14 for every $100 they bring in. In your analysis, the 25 richest Americans showed by the end of 2018, those 25 were worth $1.1 trillion it would take 14.3 million ordinary American wage earners put together to equal that same amount of wealth. The personal federal tax bill for the top 25 in 2018, just those 25 people, was $1.9 billion. The bill for those wage earners, the 14 million wage earners put together, was $143 billion. So those average wage earners are not only paying a disproportionate share of their own taxes, they're paying more in raw numbers as well to the federal government. Absolutely. Uh, and that, that astonishing figure was done by my colleague, Jeff Ernsthausen, um, who has uh, worked with me on the story. And we really wanted to highlight this basic imbalance, this stunning imbalance where uh, the ultra wealthy can develop uh, enormous sums um, from which, as I said, all of their power um, and influence emanates and all their means emanates. And it's really outside of the tax system. Those 14 plus million people are inside the tax system and they're paying their fair share. And the consequences of this uh, are that we have struggled in this country to adequately fund the federal government. Uh, periodically, people are convulsed in fear that Social Security and Medicaid, or excuse me, Medicare will go broke. Uh, roads and bridges are crumbling. Um, we need to provide for the national defense. Um, and if the federal government is constrained because the people with the most wealth um, are not paying their fair share, then uh, we wanted to highlight that system and really uh, shine a light on. So, you know, there are a lot of wealthy people, Warren Buffett included, that say, I don't want to give it to Uncle Sam. You know, I'm going to give 99.5% of my wealth away in charitable donations and philanthropic giving. I just think that I'm a better steward of my hard-earned money than the government is. What's wrong with that idea? Yes, he ex said exactly that. He um, said, I don't want to go uh, have my money being paid, uh, the, have the debt paid down to China um, when I can allocate it to something that will do more for society. And one answer 
is, uh, boy, I would like to allocate my tax dollars the way I want to. Um, I bet all the viewers would too. I bet most people have pretty strong opinions about uh, how the doofuses in Washington are spending my hard-earned money and that I could do it better than they do. And that's why we have elections and why we have a democratic society. It's a shared um, responsibility to elect leaders who then allocate our tax dollars in the way the majority uh, theoretically wants. Um, the other thing is that Philanthropy doesn't solve collective problems very well. Um, it doesn't build roads and bridges. It doesn't do mundane things. Philanthropy often for the ultra wealthy are uh, ways that they can put forward their uh, own policy choices, uh, try to dominate the conversation, have disproportionate influence. Sometimes they fund political campaigns. Sometimes they uh, ride their hobbies uh, and obsessions. It's not really the way we want to run society. It's, it's a distortion of society to have billionaires with disproportionate influence and also be subsidized by taxpayers. One of the pushbacks is going to be corporate taxes, right? Warren Buffett says Berkshire Hathaway pays a ton of corporate taxes. What's your problem here? Uh, if I have my money in that, my corporation is actually paying those taxes, I'm not trying to steal from the government. Yeah, that's a, uh, a, a valid point, and there's a lot of debate uh, amongst economists about this. Um, what I would say, two things. One is we're in a golden age of corporate tax avoidance. Um, so companies like Amazon and Apple and Facebook and Microsoft have gone to great lengths to move operations overseas to avoid American tax, and sometimes these giant corporations also pay zero in tax. Um, so, uh, you know, Amazon is a tax avoider both um, at the corporate level and then at the ownership level. Uh, the second thing is that corporate taxes don't solely fall on the owners of the corporations in probably, this is a lot, this is a matter of debate, but consumers pay corporate taxes, workers pay corporate taxes, um, at least some economists think so. So this is sort of dispersed. That's not a direct tax on the owners of the company, not a direct tax on Bezos or Musk. So one way to solve this would be to have more direct taxes on the owners of the companies. Jesse Isinger, senior reporter and editor at ProPublica, thanks so much. Thank you for having me.